Um, well, welcome everyone. I'm Nadia Sunderchi. I'm a, a, a psychiatrist um, a couple of hours north of Toronto in Canada. I um, have uh, been a CFHA member and participant in various things, including the uh, Research and Evaluation Committee and the conference for a number of years. Um, and I'm really pleased to introduce a couple of uh, colleagues from around here uh, who've joined for today's session. Um, Joanne Goldman and Leora Rato are both at the Center for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety in Toronto, um, which is a fabulous resource that um, has really kind of advanced a lot of competencies in QI, and they both have expertise in qualitative research um, uh, and, and have taught uh, folks who are involved in QI how to bring uh, qualitative principles and methods into our work. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot from them, and so I'm really uh, excited to partner with them. Um, I wonder if there's anything else the two of you want to say about uh, about yourselves? Okay. Um, I will um, invite folks who are here, if you are in a setting where you feel comfortable to do so, to feel free to turn on your cameras so that we can kind of really connect with each other today, if you're able and willing. Um, and uh, that's great. Hi, Angela. And, uh, and we welcome others to do so if you can. Um, also want to invite people to um, comment in the chat to introduce yourselves. I think we're expecting the group to sort of grow and we won't necessarily kind of go around and do introductions with everyone, but I uh, would really welcome you to, to comment in the chat about um, your background, what you're up to, um, you may just want to say if you consider yourself to be novice, intermediate, or expert in the area of QI and or in the area of qualitative, you know, any goals or, you know, what interested you in the session so that we can kind of keep those in mind as we go along. Um, and I will also just um, pop into the chat a blurb about the research um, an evaluation committee of CFHA, which is kind of the host for this webinar. Normally, Will Lucenhop would be here. Uh, some of you may know him from other sessions or from the committee. Um, he wasn't able to join to be the host. And since I'm known, we decided that I would just host us ourselves. But we just did want to share a little bit about um, the many things that the committee does uh, for CFHA members. Um, and uh, so you can take a look at those in the chat. and. Um, uh, great to start to see a little bit of um, self-introductions, and please feel free to keep that going while we dive in. Um, today's session is really about uh, how we can um, introduce uh, qualitative research principles and uh, methods and tools into QI work, um, you know, why that's relevant. And um, we know realistically we aren't going to all become qualitative research experts in this session, but uh, maybe we can start to think about uh, how we could um, introduce that uh, into our own work back at our homes. Um, the objectives, specific obje objectives are here. And one of the things that we're going to do, we're going to have some kind of back and forth tag teaming throughout the session with Joanne and Leah Hora talking about qualitative and, and me kind of providing some illustrations from a, a QI project that I've been leading um, at Waypoint, which is um, a psychiatric hospital, um, uh, about 300 beds or so, and we've been implementing quality standards around care for schizophrenia uh, for the last several years and, and using um, qualitative methods, among, among other things, um, along the way. So um, I'm just going to give you like a really kind of brief high level overview um, of the of the project uh, that we'll then sort of come back to um, over the course of the session. But um, what I but I feel like I'm I, I'm not sure, um, Joanne Leohora, if there's anything else that you wanted to say about the objectives, um, just as it relates to kind of QI as a background, or if we want to just um, kind of dive in. Happy for you to go ahead, Nadia. Okay. So, um, yeah, so the project that I have been working on for a few years, um, uh, HQO, I'm realizing, is an acronym that will be unfamiliar to most of you, as stands for Health Quality Ontario. And 
um, is really a, an organization <clears throat> driving the setting of a number of standards um, through kind of expert and stakeholder consensus um, and um, various different mental health settings, including hospitals across the uh, province of Ontario have been looking to actually kind of take those standards into our day-to-day -day clinical care. Um, I'm looking at schizophrenia care in inpatient settings. Uh, there are standards related to prescribing practices, uh, psychotherapy, so specifically CBT for psychosis and family intervention therapy, um, and continuity of care in terms of both timely follow-up post-discharge and documentation, and so on. There's a whole bunch more, but that's like more than enough for purpose of this, of this illustration. Um, one of the more complex elements to implement has been um, introducing this new, um, well, new to our organization, um, evidence-based psychotherapy, CBT for psychosis, which many of you will be familiar with. So um, I'll talk a bit about our experience and how we learned from different qualitative approaches along the way. Okay, hi everyone, it's nice to be here. And as Nadia was saying, we've worked with Nadia in the past, um, Lior and I bringing our qualitative research expertise and working together, together with Nadia and her QI expertise. And in our context in Toronto here, Lior, that's what Lior and I do. We work with um, clinicians and scientists, researchers, people doing the quality improvement. And we really value the opportunity to bring these different lenses to quality improvement work. So in the next few slides, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about very high level about qualitative research to get us thinking along sort of the same wavelength about what I'm talking about when I say qualitative research. Um, and please, we are a relatively small group. So please, if you have questions, if you wanna interrupt, like feel free to put anything in that chat box. And um, there's nice, there's three of us moderating the session. So we could definitely manage that back and forth. So qualitative research is an umbrella term for a range of methodologies. And you might be familiar with words such as grounded theory, ethnography, phenomenology, or not. Um, so it's really hard to give one definition of qualitative research. But really what we're gonna do in the next hour is just give you some sort of basic um, foundational kind of ideas that are critical in qualitative research and, and common across the different methodologies. So I'm going to start with this definition. The goal of qualitative research is the development of concepts which help us to understand social phenomena in natural rather than experimental settings, giving due emphasis to the meanings, experiences, and views of all the participants. So as, as you may know with qualitative research, we're really interested in the individual's meanings, like how they're viewing phenomenon, their interpretation of that phenomenon, how they explain that phenomenon is happening. And with qualitative research, there's a sort of general understanding that individuals, knowledge, behaviors, interactions are very much shaped by the social and cultural context in which they are embedded. And it's very relevant to QI, with QI, we're really trying to understand the context in which this QI work is happening, seeing that it's so critical to those behaviors and making change. And so qualitative research is very much aligned with you know, providing that kind of insight that is so critical to QI. So when we were talking with Nadia about the different QI projects she's been involved with this last you know, couple of years, and we were talking about the CBT for psychosis, immediately from a qualitative researcher perspective, I started thinking, you know, the kinds of questions that I would ask are, well, what are healthcare providers' perceptions of CBT for psychosis? So uh, you know, often with quality improvement, we'll see, okay, we need to implement this best practice guideline, or we need to sort of, it's more of a top-down approach. Um, from a qualitative researcher perspective, you know, we see as an integral first step, just taking a step back and exploring, but how are people even thinking? And what are their experiences of this practice that we're trying to change? And what are their experiences have, of having trying to implement this in the past? What kind of factors do, do, do they see as influencing their knowledge, their practices, um, you know, collaboration kind of issues, organizational kind of issues? So those are the kind of things that through a qualitative approach, we're gonna be talking about exploring. And so here's a second definition of qualitative research. 
Qualitative research aims to generate in-depth accounts from individuals and groups by talking with them, watching their behavior, and analyzing their artifacts, and taking into account the different contexts in which they are based. So this definition is alluding to the methods of qualitative research, which are interviews, observations, documentary analysis are the most common ones. And we're going to go into a little bit more detail about each of these methods as we go on. But when we talk about, you know, talking, watching, analyzing, it might sound kind of, you know, vague or, um, you know, like a little bit uh, informal, but there's a very systematic way that we collect data when we do qualitative research. So just to give you a little bit of an example of why you might do an interview or focus group or observations, and if we take it back to Nadia's example, we might think about doing an in-depth interview, so one-on-one, -on -one, you know, 45, 60 minute interview with a range of healthcare providers to get sort of more in-depth understandings of their perspectives and experiences regarding CBT for psychosis. We could also think about a focus group. And again, we're gonna delve deeper into when you might do a focus group or an interview later, but a focus group allows you to bring people together. And my guess is probably some of you have participated in interviews or focus groups, and you get different kinds of data from a focus group as people build off of each other and are able to um, you know, add a kind of dimension to that data, you know, insights into that phenomenon by building off of each other and responding to each other's comments that they might not have thought about in an individual interview. And then with observations, observations sort of, you know, aren't used as frequently just because it's more time intensive to be doing observations, but I actually think they're a really underutilized method in qualitative methods, but more so in, in quality improvement because people could be saying certain things in an interview or focus group, but observations gives you insights into how people are doing that, that are not necessarily understood or they're taken for granted. So for example, back to Nadia's example, um, let's say we were implementing a screening process and observing how that screening process is done could be very different than someone saying, we do a screening process or you know, their ability to, to describe what that uh, screening process looks like. So one common question that we get in our sessions that we do is that people say, I'm doing a survey, that's qualitative research. So a survey can have a qualitative element to it. It could have open-ended questions, which are a qualitative element, but it's not qualitative research because a survey does not allow you to go to the in-depth exploration probing examination that an interview or focus group would allow you to do. So there's a, definitely space for surveys and QI work, but it's not qualitative research. Qualitative research allows you to get a different kind of depth um, than someone could respond when they're ticking off a, a box in a survey or just writing a sentence or two in an open-ended kind of question. So with that sort of little background around qualitative research, there's three different ways that we think about, Lear and I think about being able to integrate qualitative research with quality improvement. And the first way is just thinking sort of very lightly about how qualitative research principles could inform your QI work. So you might walk away after this one hour session and think, oh, those interviewing ideas uh, or techniques or the kind of questions that we might think about could help me when I'm doing this QI uh, project initiative and just sort of lightly inform it. You could think about using qualitative research methods in a more rigorous manner. So this would be after this session and maybe you are doing some qualitative research, being purposeful about how you collect that, do that qualitative research component and being able to speak to it when you're going to present or publish uh, your QI work. And in this sense, the QI methodology is still at the forefront, but qualitative research is sort of a piece embedded in it. And we're gonna talk about that too. And then the third way in C is using qualitative research as part of a QI initiative or program. And C would most likely involve an experienced qualitative research that has an expertise and for example, you might have a QI research 
project going on and with the qualitative research as a substantial piece um, as part of that larger study or program. So if you, if it's okay with you, if you wanna just share with us where you see yourself sitting as A, B or C, and they're all good spaces to be, but I think it's just useful to, you know, it's useful for us to know where you're coming from. Um, and we can also speak to those different spaces. Nadia, did you want to comment at all about the surveys? I was picturing the chat lighting up with A's and B's and C's. So I, <laughs> thank you, folks. I had a moment there. Um, yeah, no, I am. Um, I think that's great, Joanne. I, I don't think I had anything else to add. I think it'll come through in the as we talk through the um, the example in the next couple of slides. Okay, just in terms of your comments about the surveys. Um, if you've had sort of that experience where you oh. had results and then you felt, oh, I could probe a little bit deeper around these results that I'm getting. Yeah, I know I am um, just the, um, my com do you mean my comment in the chat about um, with the journal? Yeah. I definitely yeah. found uh, I, like it was always a bit of a dilemma handling submissions that um, kind of presented themselves as doing qualitative research, but with kind of the text from open-ended questions in a survey because it just, the, the richness of the data as well as the understanding of the respondents context was so missing. And I like kind of always have this dilemma around wanting to encourage more, but also not quite seeing that as um, kind of fitting um, sort of the standard usually for, for publication. So mm. um, that was always the dilemma, but uh, um, really, um, appreciated when we saw kind of robust qualitative submissions. Mm -hmm. Thanks to those of you who have added into the uh, to the chat. And there's definitely, like, you know, we often get I'm at A now, but I want to move to B or I'm at B, I want to move to C. And it's not a hierarchy, but it's really an area of interest and where and how you see this fitting with the work that you do. Um, and Tisha, I see that you say all three have, I've done a lot of qualitative research, so please, I'd we'd welcome your input of your experiences, if you could add uh, more personal experiences to, the, to what we're saying. So sometimes other thing that we get is people will say, you know, with a QI project, and I probably should have said this up front, that when we talk about quality improvement, we're definitely talking about sort of the more traditional PDSA cycle type of quality improvement approach, but we also think about quality improvement in a broader way as well. Um, a quality initiative, a patient safety program you're trying to implement, or more of a research focused, larger scale uh, quality type of, of initiative. Um, so we do think about it in many different ways and see different ways that qualitative research could fit in, but we are going to focus more so in this presentation on more of the PDSA type of thinking about quality improvement. And we see different spaces for a qualitative approach to fit with the PDSA cycle approach um, to doing quality improvement work. So we could think about it as the earlier stages as using qualitative research to collect data to inform your understanding of the problem. We could think about it in terms of using it to, you have, you understand your problem, but now we need some input into how we think an intervention would be most effective to address this QI issue. We might start, you know, do a test and implement that intervention and then do another PDSA cycle and want to get some qualitative data to help us understand, you know, what was happening there actually implementation and practice. And then we also might want to use qualitative research methods later on to evaluate the impact. And quantitative outcomes, measurements are such a critical piece in QI work, um, but there is increasing recognition of the challenges of just relying on quantitative data. So we see qualitative data as really complementing, extending, uh, those quantitative pieces. So it's not one or the other, but how can they really inform each other? And um, really valuing the qualitative data, that's the kinds of meanings and insights that's not captured from that quantitative data. So Nadia, do you wanna to speak to your specific example? Yeah, I can do that. Um, and it's interesting what you were saying about PDSAs with the project that I'm 
I'm speaking about is a large like corporate strategic multi-year kind of pan hospital project and it has been um, and there isn't a huge unfortunately in our organization like literacy around QI so it's been very um, effortful to kind of introduce to people the concept of PDSA as even being a part of a project like ours but I find it a really useful way to think about the different stages of the work and how at any given time we're trying to understand the problem in the context and think about kind of our next test of change and then actually test that and learn from it and the mixing of the quantitative and qualitative um, components has been um, extremely illuminating. So um, just with um, to kind of provide an example of the qualitative questions that we've been asking um, at different stages of this project, and that has been including through interviews and focus groups. Um, you know, in the very early stages, as we were just getting started, we wanted to get a sense, of, and I was actually fairly new to my organization at that point, so it was like particularly important for me to get a, a sense of, you know, what were um, perceptions and attitudes across the organization, um, you know, in general about the HQO quality standards, but also specifically about this intervention that we, you know, we knew was an evidence-based practice, but we didn't know kind of what other people knew or, or thought about it and, and about its appropriateness for our particular patient population and setting. Um, and then as we were kind of moving forward with implementation, we needed to think about how we could actually implement screening and referral uh, and make that work within people's workflows, um, you know, across the organization and asking them goes a really long way to helping to design it in a way that people will accept and find feasible. Um, and then, um, you know, once we actually got going with doing that screening and referral um, and, and implementing, you know, delivering the CBTP for certain patients, um, we really wanted to know kind of, you know, how people experienced that and, and whether it was actually not just like whether, like, whether it was done, we could see quantitatively because we have an EHR and we could see if people were screened or not, but there's so much more to like, how did it actually go? Um, and did it go the way that we thought it would or not? And, and if not, why? Um, and then kind of with, with that around the evaluation, um, you know, there were some significant, we could see from the quantitative data, some significant variations between different units implementation and the qualitative really helped us to understand and explore kind of variations across the different um, units. And also, um, you know, there's always the possibility of unintended consequences with, with any QI intervention. And so, um, you know, what were the planned and unplanned um, kind of outcomes from an, from an experience perspective? So this kind of just like shows a little bit more some of the kind of comparing and contrasting we were able to do with our quantitative and qualitative data. And you can see in our early um, PDSAs, <laughs> very few patients actually uh, got started with the psychotherapy um, and the qualitative really helped us to understand like why um, and what we could do next in our subsequent PDSAs to kind of improve uptake, um, you know, all the way from people being here in the hospital to actually starting psychotherapy. Um, and it seemed like many people were thought not to be eligible when we talked with, um, you know, providers. It became more clear that the questions in the referral form were confusing, were leading to kind of screening people out. Um, and as well that you know, the conversations with patients were happening really early in admission and needed to be repeated and, you know, as a rapport and trust developed over time. Um, and so there were, there, there, those were things we would not have figured out just by looking at the quantitative, but they gave us some very practical um, next steps to follow up on. And we also um, partnered with our patient client family council to do um, interviews with um, people with lived experience who um, may or may not have been approached um, during the course of the PDSA cycles and learned about some of their needs um, and some of their perceptions of the work to date. Okay, so um, hi everyone. I'm gonna take over now. And um, 
for the next uh, few slides, we're I'm going to be talking more about how we can actually put some of these uh, put qualitative research practices uh, into use. So I'm first going to talk about some principles and some tenets of qualitative research that inform um, sort of the whole recess research process and that I think um, also can really inform how we think about our quality improvement work as well, even if we're not doing sort of that B or C of, of more traditional qualitative research. Uh, and then I'm going to speak about some of the methods that Joanne introduced at the beginning. So the first thing that we're uh, I'm going to talk about is this idea of reflexivity. So this is a deeply held uh, principle in qualitative research, and it's it's that we acknowledge that research uh, can't be performed uh, in a vacuum. As researchers, we all bring our subjective experiences, perceptions, values, knowledge uh, to any research endeavor we do. Um, but but as qualitative researchers, we we acknowledge it and we actually embrace this uh, bringing this to our research um, and we use it in our research but to be able to do that in a meaningful way um, we engage in something called reflexivity and this is really the process of examining uh, yourself um, what you're bringing to the research project and how as a researcher you're um, approaching your research um, so what one example of this that we use and join you can go to the next slide is we we often think that it's helpful to sort of put your quality work uh, in this box and ask yourself the following questions throughout your work so how am i thinking about this phenomena what is my vested interest in doing this work? What assumptions do I bring or do I have about uh, this phenomena? And what professional, personal experiences is, am I bringing to this work? And by doing this, I think it really helps us um, think about the decisions we're making, how we're approaching the work, the types of questions we're asking, how we're doing our analysis. Um, but it, I think in terms of a qualitative research approach, but also in terms of approaching the quality improvement work and and um, we've we've asked Nadia to to think about her project and put her project in this and and think about these questions. Yeah, so I'll just offer like a couple of very kind of candid <laughs> reflections. Um, I think it's so it's it's. Um, me, it's like a very iterative thing of sort of coming back to and, and like kind of at any given moment in time in the project, I would probably um, shift a little bit sort of the way that I describe this. But I, I mean, I, I guess I would kind of begin by acknowledging that um, as the uh, corporate sponsor for this project as the um, vice president of medical affairs the chief of staff like i've had a certain accountability to ensure this actually gets done uh, but also a role in getting to kind of like just having a lot of influence to shape um and i recognize that's a very distinct and somewhat you know privileged position compared with many of the other people that we have engaged as stakeholders in the project so i always sort of have to keep that in mind um I have been kind of, I find myself kind of impatient to like see us actually get going with implementing, you know, what I feel very strongly is like a great evidence-based treatment that's so relevant to so many patients that we have here. Um, and so all of the missed opportunities to actually kind of deliver the intervention, I, um, you know, I, um, like I feel those really deeply and I find as we go along in the project, there are moments where I just think like, this shouldn't be that complicated. <laughs> like, it's amazing how uh, small, like what seems from where I sit uh, to be like a relatively small change in practice actually, um, especially by the time you incorporate things related to the electronic health record or other requirements that people have, um, you know, kind of really, um, influence the pace at which something's able to move uh, across the organization and then just being mindful too of the impacts that the pandemic has had um, 
um, to all of this and how we've had to adapt that along the way. Um, but the work has involved uh, people from many different disciplines, um, both delivering the therapies and um, kind of referring and also supervising and different things. And so there's been like a really strong sort of team-based effort and it's been great at bringing my psychiatry lens to get to be a part of that. Thanks, Nadia. Um, I'm also wondering if if any of you uh, participating, if you if any of you have any reflections on these questions, or if you've sort of had a moment to think about them, and if it's made you think maybe differently. Uh, if you want, we'd be happy if you wanted to to unmute and share, or if you wanted to share anything in the chat. Um, we often find that this type of reflection people have, and it and it doesn't even necessarily have to be something specific to your project, but maybe even the process of thinking about these questions. Um, I'm Dr. Clayton Smith. I am the psychologist. Um, I'm in Eastern Washington State, and I'm the faculty at a family medicine residency clinic. And I think the biggest thing is just having to adjust the way I talk about research when talking to medical residents because their approach to um, clinical quality improvement is very different. It's much shorter. They're definitely less interested in it than people who, like us, you know, have a lot more training in research. So it's actually been really, really interesting to have to shift my way of thinking and, you know, teach them and while also, you know, helping them to make their work really meaningful. So it's it's been just kind of a shift and having to adjust my own expectations about what can be achieved, you know, with a clinic-based QI versus a longer-term QI. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. My name's Dr. Lisa Chuma, and I teach at A.T. Still University in osteopathic medical school, and our students train in community health centers across the country. And my role um, with a HRSA grant is actually to train the preceptors um, in integrated behavioral health this in, for this portion of the grant. And so as part of that, we're doing quality improvement projects. And the difficult part for me, I have to echo what Angela said, is how I frame quality improvement and quote research because that word tends to scare, scare people off not only in residency but in clinical practice i think and so um what i found to be pretty effective is not to use those words at all initially and just say what are some of your challenges what is going really well for you and then what are some of your challenges and what would make that better and and it's interestingly clinicians are really, and, and I will say our group is both um, medical providers and behavioral health providers in this training program. Um, and we're all trained to think very logically and analytically about things. And some, sometimes we skip the qualitative piece that's the meaning piece, I think. And so just by focusing on meaning rather than statistics or outcomes or p-values or all these things that make us scared right when we're <laughs> in, in practice i think sometimes that is the most helpful um, approach because once i get them started i cannot stop them <laughs> like they are running cycle pdsa cycles like um like champions after you know two or three months you just they really struggle with kind of the first one and then that second one they pick up speed by the third one i'm just like i can't keep up with all of you <laughs> that's great um so i really think it's how we frame it and you know kind of frame it as opportunities or challenges rather than research per se absolutely thank you move on. So we'll move on to the next principle, uh, which is the iterative nature of qualitative research. Um, so a lot of people, when they approach this kind of work, they, they think, well, I have to set my goals, I have to set my aim, I have to figure out what my measures are, and I have to stick with them throughout the whole project. 
Whereas in qualitative research, we understand that as you learn new things, you're going to adjust what questions you're asking, what type of data you're collecting. And it is an ongoing um, process where oftentimes you may have completely revamped your research questions that you thought you were going to be asking to fit better um, the context that you're doing your quality work or your qualitative research work. And we find that this actually really echoes um, quality improvement work and the model for improvement where you are constantly learning and changing and adapting. So we, we actually see a lot of parallels in this type of work and taking this qualitative mindset can really um, enhance your quality improvement work. And uh, then the last, um, the last uh, principle from qualitative research that we think has a lot of, um, uh, can really help with your quality improvement work is this idea of approaching your work as an insider versus an outsider. So you'll often hear this, that I am an insider or I am an outsider doing this work. And in quality improvement, it is often trying to make change or trying to do your work within your own setting. So we often sort of conceptualize quality improvement work as insiders doing this work. So as an insider, you, you're deeply knowledgeable about the setting. You can understand um, the people around you. You sort of understand the culture. Whereas as an outsider, you might not have that kind of knowledge, but as a it, taking a quali qualitative uh, research mindset as an outsider, it actually allows you to question things that an insider might take for granted. Um, it really allows you to question things and to think differently and to um, ask questions that others wouldn't necessarily ask. Um, but sort of, I, I think a, a nicer way to think about this is the idea that we're all actually insiders and outsiders. So we actually all exist in this space between an insider and an outsider. And so I think uh, it encourages us to question what might be taken for granted, even if you are working within your own setting. You know, people might say to you, well, you know how it is. This is the way we do it. So I think qualitative research actually encourages you to question when people say something like that, when people aren't problematizing, when people aren't trying to describe things because they, they take it for granted. So those are uh, the three, three principles of uh, qualitative research that we think really can impact the way we're doing our quality improvement work. So join me, we will. So we're going to. Oh, do you want me to comment on, on our experience with our students? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. It's, just, it's kind of a fun example, I think, of occupying that space between insider and outsider. Um, for the last few years, we've had the pleasure of having medical students um, spend uh, a summer with us doing kind of a research project um, related to this QI work and um, and that you know their contributions have really enabled us to to move forward with a qualitative component. Um, they have like a particularly in between space, I think, because they're becoming they're in the process of becoming indoctrinated into our you know professional um, culture, values, norms, um, you know, et cetera. Um, but they're still pretty early in that process. Uh, they're still really forming. Um, they're not full fledged and, um, you know, even just kind of their knowledge and their language and so on. It's all at a particular space, which is like kind of neither totally insider nor outsider. Um, they also start the summer being completely unfamiliar with our organization and then sort of over the course of the summer, they become more familiar and that is also part of a bit of a transition from being an outsider to kind of like a sort of insider, but not quite really right. Um, and, and some years they've been here physically on site, some years they've only been virtual, and that has also really influenced the extent to which they make that transition. 
Um, and then lastly, they're working with a team of folks here who can really help to shed light on, um, you know, the context and the structures and history and why things are the way they are. But there are kind of fresh questions also really get us questioning some of our assumptions about, you know, what, why things, how things are actually working, why they are the way they are, and the extent to which they may or may not be modifiable. Just a few thoughts about kind of how we've um, kind of leveraged this this particularly in between group. Thanks, Nadia. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to thinking about how we can apply some of these methods to our quality improvement work. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the idea of qualitative sampling, and, and I'm going to distinguish it uh, a bit from more quanti quantitative uh, sampling. So we often think in quantitative sampling is you're trying to generalize to the population to try and uh, understand um, the phenomena, but the aim of qualitative sampling is not to generalize it's it's instead to select information rich cases very strategically and purposefully. So you may have actually heard of the concept of purposeful sampling. Um, so Joanne, if you want to move to the next slide. So purpose of sampling is actually a a range of different ways you can think about who you are going to engage in your qualitative work. Um, and there's a lot of different types. So the one we often think about is the idea of maximum variation. So this is where you're looking for a broad range of experiences. So you might um, want to include all professional members of a team or a unit or a group. So physicians, nurses, social workers, um, across a range of different units. You might, in an organization, target different clinical settings to get that broad range of experiences. Uh, on the other, you might look at sort of looking at a typical. So if you want to understand everyone who sort of is very typical in one experience um, and not look for deviant cases. On the other hand, you might want to look at deviant cases. So you might want to uh, interview everyone who does really well on a certain process to try and understand what they're doing that other people aren't doing. You might want to interview people who, who are sort of more marginalized to try and understand their experience. Um, another type of purposive sampling that's often talked about is the idea of snowball sampling. So in this case, you might use your current participants to identify other participants. So you might say to someone, you know, I'm interested in speaking to other people that you think uh, have similar experiences, similar perceptions to you, do the same job as you. Or you might say, I'd really actually like to speak to someone who you think would give a very different perspective than you. So it's a, it's a way of using your participants to identify more participants. And a, a last example is the idea of really trying to understand similar experiences. So you might, uh, like the example up here, interview all the clinicians who have just been trained on this new process. So instead of trying to uh, look broadly, you look more narrowly, which actually can allow you to get more depth of a particular experience. So these, all these choices are really about the questions that you're trying to answer. Um, and then now I'm going to talk about interviews, which I think are the, um, the most common form of data collection in qualitative research. And we, you can go to that next slide, Joanne. So we use this slide a lot to try and really highlight the qualities and the characteristics of uh, qualitative researchers. And we, when we present to clinicians, often uh, acute care clinicians, we use um, this slide to distinguish between a clinical interview and a qualitative interview. And I'm actually interested, you can, um, say something in the chat if this um, example resonates with you. Um, so a clinical interview is really about trying to fit the participant's experience into a particular category. 
um, as the interviewer, you're guiding the content. It's very directive and you're probing to seek particular information. You move from broader to more focused as you get more information. Um, and it's really part of a wider clinical experience of the people being interviewed. And I think what's particularly import, uh, important to highlight is the aim is to, for you as the clinician to provide expertise and assistance to the person you're interviewing. Whereas uh, with a qualitative interview, this is really about exploring from the interviewee's perspective, their experience, understanding meaning values of that phenomena. It's really the participant that identifies and discusses aspects of the phenomenon that are important to him or her. So as an interviewer, you might have particular topics you want to cover, but you are really allowing that participant to guide the discussion. You're, you're probing, you're actually trying to get broader with the interview. You're, you're probing for insights, thoughts, feelings, experiences, stories. Um, it takes time. So hopefully you're allowing more time for these interviews uh, as opposed to within this sort of clinical set appointment time. Um, and most importantly, the aim is to learn from the participant as the expert. Okay. Um, and I think Oftentimes, when we talk about qualitative interviews, we, we, we talk about the idea of a semi-structured interview um, as the most traditional approach to doing qualitative interviews. But I, I actually like to think of it on a spectrum um, where this idea of a semi-structured interview sits on this, structure, this spectrum where at one end we have a very structured interview. So it's almost like doing a, a, a verbal survey where you ask the same questions the same way to people versus on the other side, you have more of a conversation where it's completely open-ended. You might not even have a set of questions. So this semi-structured interview sits in the middle where you're gonna have your set of questions and some probes and some ideas you wanna cover, but it is still a conversation where each, each interview is gonna be completely different because it really is the participant that's guiding that interview. And depending on a range of factors, you're going to have your interview somewhere on this spectrum. So if, you, if you're fairly certain you understand the phenomenon very well and you're trying to get specific feedback, um, if there isn't as much depth you're looking for, if you have more of a, a similar group of people, you might have a more structured, semi-structured interview. But if you're really at the beginning and you're just really trying to understand that phenomena from a range of different people, you might allow for more of an open-ended conversation. And I'll also say throughout your data collection, your interviews may get more structured as you're learning more and you're realizing um, more specifically what kind of information you're trying to collect. Um, and I, I find it helpful when we're thinking about qualitative interviews to think about why we're asking the particular questions that we're asking. And I find it helpful to think about it in these four different categories. So the first type of question you might be asking is around the experience or the behavior. So what what does this person do? How do they do it? What is their experience of it? And then you might go further to say, well, what do you actually think about this? What are your opinions? What are your beliefs? And then um, going even one step further is this idea of asking feeling questions. So someone may think that a particular intervention is really relevant and really important and supports its implementation, but when they actually have to do it, they feel a lot of pressure to do it right, or they feel worried about how people are perceiving it. So it's nice to, uh, to go beyond and ask people's feelings. And the last one is knowledge questions, where you actually wanna understand what that interviewee understands about um, a particular phenomenon and what factual informations they have. 
Um, so based on Nadia's um, project, we just uh, came up with a few questions just to illustrate um, the difference in these questions. So for the experience or behavior, what is your experience with, ass with assessing a patient's eligibility to receive the uh, CBT and obtain their consent? And then the opinion question is, do you think that it's actually useful, acceptable or feasible? And then how do you feel when discussing with patients the option to refer? And the, the knowledge question around what do you, what are, do you know what you're supposed to do um, with this process? And then finally, uh, we're, I'm just going to quickly add a note around focus groups. Um, because I think a lot of people think that focus groups are really just a more efficient way to interview lots of people. Whereas focus groups really do have, are different. Focus groups are different than one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interviews. Um, so they are more efficient. You can get more uh, perceptions, but their real strength is that you have a group of people in a room that can build off each other, um, that can add to the conversation a way that a one-on-one -on -one interview uh, might not happen. They can use their own vocabulary, generate their own questions. It really allows those cultural values, norms to surface during the conversation. And it's, it is actually a nice way to engage people in this type of work. Um, so when you're doing your focus groups, it's not just about asking each person a question. It's about encouraging the people in the group to have a conversation amongst themselves, a guided conversation, um, which is actually more difficult to facilitate. So focus groups do require additional facilitation skills. And often we recommend bringing in a second person to observe because there are things that are happening in a focus group that you might not see on your recorder, eye rolls, nodding, when everyone agrees with what someone's saying. Um, other challenges with focus groups is they can be difficult to schedule, but I think importantly is also thinking about who's in the room. You know, you may want to, if you are going to bring a team together, you might want to think about that hierarchy, the power uh, issues about bringing those groups together. So even though I've talked about a lot of benefits of a focus group, sometimes if you really want to get an individual's uh, views or perceptions, it could be better to do a one-on-one -on -one interview. So there's no right answer and it really depends on, uh, the group and your questions. Senor, I can just um, kind of add to that from our example. We did um, a focus group very deliberately with the 10 um, clinicians from across the hospital who were all newly trained. Um, and they were, they did get talking to each other and they raised things as a result of that, that I don't think any one of them would have said in an individual conversation because just as one example, you know, they experienced variable levels of support or lack of support from their managers. And I think some of them like felt more empowered to raise that on behalf of others. And that theme came forward in a way that it wouldn't have in the individual conversations where people might've been worried about being identifiable for, for that comment. Um, but we would not have also, <laughs> we would not have gotten there if we had done like a mixed focus group with the clinicians and managers or, you know, others that they didn't feel like that kind of sense of safety was. So um, just to illustrate how it could help, but um, has to be really carefully navigated. Before we go on to the next few slides, does anybody have any questions or comments or experiences of participating in an interview or a focus group or you know, using that in your QI work at all that you want to share? Okay, so we're gonna go and talk a little, just a little bit about observation. So like I said before, I think observations are an underutilized method, uh, particularly drawing upon a qualitative research approach for using observations in QI work. 
And some of the reasons why we might think about doing observations to help inform our understanding of a QI problem or what's happening in practice or how change is happening is because while we might do an interview or a focus group, people may not think to talk about something in an interview. They might take it for granted that you know it or that it's not relevant or not important, or that it might just be not good timing to talk about it, or the interviewer's questions might, we might even think about to ask the question um, that might be really useful. So when we do observations, we get different kinds of insights than an interviewer or focus group. And sometimes in an interview, people will say what they do. So we do have interprofessional rounds every week, but going and observing how they're actually done, who's part of the rounds, who's standing where, do people interrupt each other? Are they cut short um, often because there's other priorities going on? Those kind of things you could capture in observations that are really critical uh, to your QI initiative, but might not be um, captured in other kinds of data collection methods. And also with observations, we could really focus in on interactions, the physical space, the objects in that environment that are influencing the practice. So for example, how are people using the, the computers in that space? How is the computer interaction affecting their interaction with other healthcare providers or with the patients or, or clients, um, et cetera? So observations really give a different kinds of insights um, that are really valuable. And like Leora was talking before about, you know, the range of structured to unstructured approaches with interviewing, we could think about it the same way as with observations. So there are cases where people use observations in QI or research. Sometimes those tend to be more, um, more focused. So for example, you know, a very easy example is hand hygiene. You know, are people washing their hands or not on a regular basis? Or are people, you know, observing if when someone's uh, prescribing or, or giving medications, are they being interrupted? So those kind of observations are more structured. At the other end, we could think about them being more unstructured, that you're going and really trying to initially get a whole sense of that context in which this behavior that you're aiming to target or change is occurring. And then somewhere in the middle, like similar to the semi-structured interviews, you might start out with a very unstructured approach. I really just want to go in and understand this environment in which this behavior is taking place. And then over time, if you spend a bit more time observing, you, you kind of focus in and go, wow, this is really important to understand um, the sharing of information that's happening at this particular point in that healthcare practice and really focus in on who's sharing what information, who's interacting with who, you know, are they using paper or computers in that interaction? How is communication being passed on from one person to the next that observations can allow you to capture? And this is from an eth ethnographic approach to observations that I like to use when I'm doing observing observations because it just sensitizes, it's a bit overwhelming, but it sensitizes you to the kind of things that you could be looking for that might be really critical to understanding your QI uh, phenomenon, but, um, but might not be thought about as, oh, we should be looking at that. So for example, the physical space, the physical things, the people involved, how people are interacting with each other, the activities that are happening. And obviously it will really vary depending on your topic that you're examining. And this might lend itself to particular QI um, activities than others. So whether it's interviews, observations, uh, focus groups, a really key part is documenting your data. And sometimes we'll have informal conversations as part of QI. We talk to stakeholders, we talk to different healthcare providers involved, um, patients, clients, um, and sometimes those we expect kind of goes in the back of our minds and it informally influences how we're going about our QI work. But we could think about more purposefully doing qualitative research and QI work and then how we capture that data and use it uh, to inform the process over time. So recording and transcribing your interviews or your focus groups is really the goal, I think the best approach, but it is very uh, resource intensive, it costs money. Um, but there are ways that it could be done easier now with um, certain recording systems. Um, another option, if you don't have the resources to transcribe your interviews in your focus groups, is to just record it and then play it back and listen to it. 
You don't have to describe it if you don't have the research for that, but you have it and listening to it just helps you remember what was shared. And then it's always good to take rough notes and then you can always add detailed notes as soon as possible. So if you have an opportunity to do a, sometimes, you know, a busy healthcare provider only has a 20 minutes for an interview. You sit down, you talk for 20 minutes, you take notes as you're talking. And then as soon as you leave that, that space, you know, finding a space to sit down and write more detailed notes is really essential because we all know how quickly it is that we forget what was said, what was said, um, and even those notes around that interaction, like for example, we might ask questions and then, um, you know, having a sense of, of people's comfort or lack of comfort with that, um, answering that question could give you insights as well into their thoughts about that phenomenon. So as Leora was saying before, with qualitative research, it's a very iterative process of data collection, analysis, and interpretation. And it's a strength of qualitative research that we're continuously using our data collected to inform our next stages. And I'm just gonna wrap up here with one slide on analysis, because I know this is a tough, sometimes it's a tough um, uh, part. And Netta, you can maybe speak to this also, you've collected this data, and then what do you do with this data? So just also talk about sort of some major uh, steps in the process is first becoming familiar with your data. Spend time reading your transcripts, your notes, what you've uh, collected through your qualitative data methods. Just get comfortable with it. And even going back and rereading it, you know, a few times, you see different things that come out from your data, depending what you're looking for. Um, and then there's the process of categorizing the data. So with called coding the data in qualitative research, where you go and you make sort of a descriptive label beside chunks of your data that reflect the main idea in that data. And that's relevant to your QI priorities and interests. And then the last stage is bringing together those different pieces of coded data to uh, add meaning to it. So for example, you might have with categorizing the data that um, you know, different descriptions of what different healthcare providers are doing in relation to that data. And then when you start looking at across, you might see some uh, deeper meanings coming from that in terms of, hmm, is there communication issues going on there? Are there sort of professional boundaries, tensions that are happening here that are influencing the screening process, the treatment process, the referral process? So there's different stages of engaging and interrogating with your data. And Nadia, maybe I'll pass it on to you now just to sort of wrap up with some thoughts around how you've engaged with your data and how it's used over time with your quality improvement work. Yeah, for sure. Um, I And backing up for just a sec, I will just say I didn't want to interrupt earlier, but as we were thinking about the value of observations, I really feel like for us that's been a missing component, especially in the last couple of years, as we can't have, um, you know, our students on site and in the hospital and I just can't wait till we can get back to actually going out and watching how the processes are unfolding because like I just think how much we would learn by understanding like the physical space and time in which um, you know the work is happening and the opportunities that people do or don't have to interact with each other professionally around this and even just like is the you know data um, where we're monitoring kind of rates of screening and referral, like actually shared or posted anywhere on the program. Like these are just the things that we don't know because we're not physically there. So um, anyway, I just wanted to comment on, on that backing up a little bit. Um, on the subject of data analysis, um, I think particularly for folks who are um, more novice, like this can be kind of one of the most confusing and sort of daunting parts. Um, I have found that um, it's really helpful to start with um, a framework um, that can help to inform that initial sort of coding. So in our project, we've often relied on implementation science frameworks, but um, you know, that's the consolidated framework for implementation research, but um, most recently in a different stage of the work, we've even just looked at like, is there any framework that defines like the different elements of continuity of care or transitions in care and so on, and just having something to kind of attach the <laughs> data to as an initial kind of starting point can make it so much more manageable to wrap one's head around. Um, the, the other thing that I would say is like kind of really um, being careful to avoid premature 
kind of conclusions or closing in on and really kind of pushing ourselves to overcome our cognitive biases to really look at like kind of any, you know, is there anything that disconfirms a theory that we're starting to develop as we're working through our data? And then lastly, um, I, I this might like, I'm interested in what you guys think about this. I, uh, it may be a little counterintuitive sometimes, but I often feel like it's really helpful if the analysis can generate some kind of a, like a figure or like that there needs to be like some, for me, I always feel incomplete until I have like some kind of visual representation um, of the data. And I just like to sketch while I'm analyzing and just try to like, it's another way to really feel that I understand and can communicate to other people kind of the themes and learnings from uh, the interviews or, or other qualitative data. So curious for your thoughts on that. Any other questions from anyone? Just to know if this resonates with you, does it build on what you're up to? Was there anything missing? Thanks, Lisa, and you're welcome. And I, I will shoot you a message that we can uh, catch up offline too. All right, thanks for the opportunity to meet you and to have this uh, discussion with you. Thanks everyone, have a great afternoon. Bye.